So it's the start of a new year, and that means a butt-ton of brand new releases, and any single one of them could be the big book of 2016. At this time last year, publishers were busy flogging a book from a little-known author called The Girl on the Train. On top of that, I've got all the best of lists, and not only from the heavy hitters like the New York Times or Publishers Weekly, but all you booktubers out there in your year-end best of lists, which means a ton of really great big books. But the problem is, is a lot of those big books just are swinging a miss for me, and maybe they come bearing the weight of too much expectation, but suddenly I find myself with back-to-back -back slogs and 500 pages into a DNF, and I am right in the middle of this literary fiction reading slump. So then arrives Wesley Chu's The Lives of Tao. Now unfortunately, I realize it's now a mass market paperback, and Literally, it's been decades since I purchased one of those. I tend to run towards a trade paperback or ebook with hardcover running a close second. I mean, a mass market paperback, that really just doesn't fit with the rest of my shelves. But publishing format aside, The Lives of Tao is exactly what the doctor ordered to break me out of my reading slump. Wesley Chu is a sometimes actor, stuntman, and now a sci-fi writer, which is frankly what 13-year-old me wanted to be when he grew up. Now, coincidentally, the plot itself is something that 13-year-old me probably would have written. So let's take a look at what we've got here. We have an alien race crash landing on Earth, but they're finding the atmosphere inhospitable, so they need to find hosts to actually survive. Except they crash land well before humans, and so ride shotgun with dinosaurs, and the mammals, and eventually the homo sapiens. Now, the quasing, as they're called, can't direct action and take over their host bodies, and merely ride shotgun in the back. It's that tiny voice inside your head. And they're responsible for some of the great minds in history, from Genghis Khan to Shakespeare. Now, what they're trying to do is bring about the technological advances necessary so that they can get back home. They're just sort of helping us along. And that's what they break off into factions. The Genjix, frankly, who can blame them, are sick of waiting and figure they just need to kill off most of the humans, subjugate the rest, and just have some fun here on Earth. Whereas the Profists are like, whoa, 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 no, no, no one needs to kill any humans. We can figure this out if we all work together. Basically, the Genjix are the Empire, ruthless and single-minded, where the Profis are the Rebellion, sort of a ragtag group just trying to do right. On that backdrop comes Rowan Tan, out-of-shape IT schlub who basically works in Inatech. Hates his job, hates his life, but through an unforeseen set of circumstances, finds himself playing host to a Profis quasing named Tao. Q, getting in shape montage, training with a super hot female agent. While there's odd couple thing going on in his head that Tao basically Cyrano's him into a relationship with his hot female co-worker. Mr. Miyagi's him with a James Bond equivalent of wax on, wax off as he's monitoring empty beaches and following unimportant people. Then the inevitable trench run, long odds, big baddie, climactic conclusion. I mean, these are all tropes that 13-year-old me would have copped to, but you know what? Present day me really loved this and had a ton of fun with the story. I mean, I could explain to you the plot of Kung Fury, Renegade Cop, goes back in time to battle the Kung Fury, um, which basically sounds ridiculous, but it is awesome. Actually, you know what? You should just go check it out. I'll wait here. Wasn't that freaking awesome? So yeah, forget that the plot could have been written by a 13-year-old because it was executed to perfection. It was an action-filled romp that was a ton of fun. It took my reading slump and kicked it in the nards. And meanwhile, we took road trip to Vegas, Went to the shooting range, smoked cigars, and drank mojitos at Casa Fuente, and then caught the late showing of O oh, at the Bellagio, which is to say, this is exactly what I needed. But I've been thinking about the book since I finished it, and it had added significance in light of the hashtag Oscars So White and the interview that Jen Yamato had of the Coen brothers recently, where they came off as the most entitled white guy douches ever and proceeded to mansplain, gaslight, and white guy hand wave over the issue of diversity. I mean, they just came off as huge dicks. I'm reminded of the commencement address that David Foster Wallace gave at Kenyon College. And yes, I've mentioned it before. It is my favorite commencement speech of all time. And he starts with the story of two fish swimming in the ocean when they see an older fish coming their way. And he gets closer, he nods his head, and says, Morning, boys. How's the water? The fish continue on until one fish looks at the other and says, what the hell's water? And really, what it's trying to say is that the most important and obvious realities are often the hardest to see and talk about. Jen Yamato was basically asking the Coen brothers, how's the water? And they responded by basically patting her on the head and say, wow, you speak English really well, but you should probably leave the writing to us. And what becomes clear is their absolute and unshakable privilege and their unwillingness to examine that same privilege. I didn't grow up with a lot of diversity in my reading, and it didn't diminish my enjoyment. 
I mean, it was basically the water that surrounded me in everything from comics to books to TV and movies. But I've been reading a lot more diversely and coming across more diverse characters like Rowan Tan, and it sparked something. It's recognition. I mean, 13-year-old me would have loved the Rowan Tan. 13-year-old me needed more characters like Rowan Tan and less like Wong Duk Dong. Tony Chu, Chow Yun Fat, uh, Amadeus Cho, and Harold Lee are so important. I mean, don't add Asians to your writing just for the sake of adding a person of color. Add Asians to your writing because that is exactly what your reality looks like now. And it would mean a hell of a lot to the 13-year-old me's that are still out there and reading. Anyway, were there any sort of cultural touchstones for you growing up? Was there an Italian or Greek or maybe a red-headed hero that you identified with and sparked that recognition when you came across it? Let me know in the comments below.